Before I get started here with the main topic, I would like to warn you uh, that in the uh, Zoroastrian community, we always say if you put two Zartoshtis or two Zoroastrians together, you get five different opinions. So uh, please don't be surprised if I said things which are different uh, uh, from uh, anything else uh, which was stated so far about our religion. That's a well-established tradition in our religion. And uh, I actually like that very much. As uh, your good professor, uh, uh, Professor Mira Mahdi, uh, was talking to me recently in uh, a uh, TV program that I had, I said there is no way that people who are against religions, they can eradicate the, uh, the religion. The religion is going to, here to stay. I mean, any religion that has been started uh, as lately as uh, yesterday. We'll have some followers and they keep going on. That's not the thing to do if you feel like the, a religion is teaching wrong ideology. We all have to strive to have many, many religions. Once you have many religions in the world and you support their followers, every single religion becomes a safe religion. I'm scared of the day that only there is one religion in the entire world or only a few religions. They become strong and that's no good. So uh, following that tradition and uh, following my own opinion about this, uh, I'm uh, very happy to present a different point of view uh, if it uh, happened to be so. Now, uh, I, when I was speaking to few of you who uh, uh, arrived here first, I uh, said few things about the fire temples in Zartoshti tradition and uh, how they've been. Pretty much the uh, fire temples or our Daremers, the door to love, Mer means love, uh, it has been pretty much the same way as it's now. Usually uh, there has been a community hall by our archeological uh, discoveries that have been made of those uh, destroyed uh, fire temples that we had before the uh, uh, conquest of Arabs or the attacks of Arabs on the country about 1400 years ago. Uh, so they all support that always there has been a library, always there has been a community hall, always there has been a fire temple, a fire burning in a specific place, with uh, some degree of uh, sacred or holiness assigned to it. And also there have been uh, sport facilities, although we have a small basketball court here. I don't know if that qualifies as a sport facility or not. But uh, th that usually has been the collection that for uh, uh, millennia, uh, has been there in terms of uh, our uh, uh, praying facilities, worship facilities. Now, uh, also I mentioned that there are two types of fire that we support. One is a, a sacred fire or consecrated fire. The other one is non-consecrated fire. The fire here is non-consecrated. There, certain rituals have, and traditions have to be followed in order to establish a consecrated fire. Among those, which is most meaningful to me, is that from 17 different professions, the home of 17 different professions, the families have to bring in their fire and join the fires together. I think that has a tremendous simple, uh, symbolic meaning to uh, anybody who hear about it. And then, of course, when the fires were joined together, Mubeds will uh, uh, consecrate the fire further by reciting the Gathas. So that is, uh, now I 
go to the main topic of uh, my uh, uh, lecture here today. Uh, first, I want to make a distinction between the philosophy of religion and religious philosophy. I'm not going to talk about religious philosophy. Re religious philosophy is look from an inside to the outside world. You believe certain things and you try to philosophize and interpret everything else according to your beliefs. And we know about that in many different religions to be the case. Now, uh, I try to avoid that. I try to, uh, when I speak, to uh, speak in terms of the philosophy of religion, having a neutral look at uh, the various uh, philosophies taught in various religions. Now, here I've listed, unfortunately, is not that clear. If uh, you turn that light off, it might be yeah, better. So, uh, yeah, so uh, you know, these are the list of all major uh, religions of the world, Abrahamic, including Judaism, Christianity, Islam, Baha'im, Mormonism. They are all under the rubric of uh, uh, Abrahamic religions. Then you have uh, Indian religions, Iranian religions, uh, Zaratushti, uh, Manichaeanism, uh, Mazdakis, uh, Yazidis, uh, Ahl Haq. Uh, these are various Iranian religion of Iranian origin, which are completely different from Abrahamic, of course. They have some similarities with Indian religion. Now, the East Asian also, you see, and modern religions like Unitarian uh, churches and uh, uh, also uh, Church of Scientology, uh, which are uh, different, but they are under the rubric of modern religions. Now, my way of, and I think many other people, way of studying any religion is First, to pay attention that according to that religion, what are the God's attributes? How in that particular religion God has been defined? The second thing that we have to pay attention to is the teachings of the prophet of the re that religion. The third one that I normally pay attention when I uh, speak about comparative religions is the character of the prophet. What kind of life that prophet led? And what was the character of that prophet? And the fourth one is the influence and the consequences of that particular uh, religious teachings. So uh, this is, I think, a, uh, a systematized and fair way of uh, 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 defining religions. Now, let me start with the uh, life and character of uh, Zarathustra. Zarathustra was born close to 4,000 years ago uh, uh, to a set of parents. The mother was Dagdowa, and uh, the uh, name of the father was Porishaspas Pitama. Now, uh, Poroshaspa, uh, just to familiarize you with the uh, names at that time, Poro means poor, plenty. Uh, I mean, there are a couple of uh, Farsi-speaking people uh, amongst the students here. Uh, uh, Poroshaspa. Shaspa it means asp. Porosh, aspa. Aspa is asp. Still in Persian, a horse is asp. So, the possessor of a lot of horses. So people to give themselves some importance, you know, they would give these names to their children or to themselves. Now, Zarathustra, by, by all accounts, was a truly genius child. He's the type of person that, in my opinion, uh, is born once every 10,000, 15,000 years. He had no other claims and his followers don't have any other claim except accepting 
that he was for that time, and still to this time, he was a true genius. Now, uh, he was an outstanding debater. At age 10, he debated the major clergy in Shah uh, Gushtaspa or Vishtaspas. Again, Aspa, Vishtaspa. I said Asp means horse. So Vishtaspa, wish means plenty again. <laughs> In, in the a different meaning of plenty. So Vishtaspa, that king has plenty of horses, of course. So uh, the, uh, the, uh, the clergy in the uh, court of Vishtaspa decided to debate Zaratustra because Zaratustra was talking strangely to them. And they decided, went to King Vishtaspa, and King Vishtaspa said, well, I have no religious knowledge, got the head clergy, and the head clergy debated Zaratustra, and on his way home, the head clergy of Ishtaspa's court, the legend has it, that died of heart attack. In modern medicine, we call that heart attack by su uh, suicide by heart attack. So uh, he was so stressed out, poor guy, perhaps this is why he died. Uh, perhaps was old too. Anyways. The Zaratustra, at his own time, was a reformer, was a revolutionary, and he called himself nothing else but a mantran. Mantran. The word mantra. Mantran means uh, thought provoker. He called himself a mantran. He said, all I'm doing, I'm provoking your thoughts in a godly direction, in the right direction in the direction of the creator. And he was a revolutionary because in Gothos over and over, we see that he recommends to free ourselves of the imaginary gods, the evas, the evas. In current Farsi, the eva has become div, in Latin languages has become theo, theology. So uh, Zaratustra said, free yourself of the imaginary gods. The imaginary gods of the time were plenty. We had the god of thunder. We, got, we had the god of famine. We had the god of, god of good things, bad things, rain, storm, uh, rivers, uh, oceans, all sorts of gods. So he said, all these are imaginary. Zaratustra married. You know, in normal way, he was born in normal way. He had a life in a normal way. He married and uh, had six children, three boys and three girls. The, something which is very close to my heart is how he named his youngest daughter. He called his youngest daughter Poro Chista. Poro, again, poor, I just told you what it means. It means plenty. Chista has two meanings. One is knowledge, still is used in current Persian, by the way. One is knowledge, the other one is puzzle. So called his youngest daughter against the tradition of the time, uh, uh, the possessor of plenty of knowledge and, uh, uh, and puzzle. Now, uh, he basically recommends for all of us to discover our own creator by trying to understand the creator's language. He does not believe that creator talks in our language. He has his own specific language. And he tries to teach us the language of God. And he says, once you learn this language, you become a godly person. I'm going over a lot of material very fast. So uh, I, uh, I'm going to depend on your questions, if there were any at the end, to uh, pay more attention to any vague points, points uh, that I'm making here. Uh, also, I have a description of God in Abrahamic religion as a point of comparison, 
uh, a being who created the world and who rules over the universe is uh, a completely separate uh, separate uh, being from the universe which created which uh, pays attention to every aspect of each individual's life that's the Abrahamic religion tradition. If something bad happens, God, for some reason, created that bad thing. If something good happened, we did well, and God rewarded us in life, and we, re we reward us after life. Now, before I forget, let me tell you, Zaratustra only speaks of life, does not address our condition before coming to this life and does not address anything about afterlife. There are things in Gathas that has been interpreted and still can be interpreted by some people as uh, what Zaratustra has talked about in afterlife, which you know most modern linguists do not believe that that would be the case. Now, you know, there are various gods in various religions. For example, uh, the m monotheistic god is, uh, of course, in monotheistic tradi religious tradition. Uh, I'm talking about the philosophy of religion here a little bit. The, uh, the god is omniscient, omnipotent, omnibenevolent, and omnipresent knows everything, is everywhere, and does everything, and has the ability to do everything. Now again, before I forget, in the religion of Zaratustra, that's not the picture of God. God cannot deviate from his own rules, so cannot change the rules of the game, cannot create miracles, magics, things like that, in the religion of Zaratustra do not exist. So this is different. Now, th then you have monistic, polytheistic, uh, uh, pantheistic, panentheistic. Let me just pay a little bit attention to pantheistic. According to pantheistic religions, pan means everything, all. And they believe that God is everything, exists in everything. That's the end of it. That's pantheistic religion. Now, in panentheistic religion, God is in everything, exists in everything, is the collection of everything that uh, exists in the entire universe, and is something more than that. Panen means more than all. So what's that factor that in panentheistic religions God has, which is more than everything that exists in the universe, is a sense of self-conscious. God knows that it exists. And this seems to be Zaratustra's tendency. Zaratustra's religion, according to my version of understanding it and many others, is a panentheistic religion, is in everything, has the knowledge of everything, because if he didn't have the knowledge, he could not have created. In order for you to create even a small thing, to create even a dish, you have to have certain knowledge about taste of food, the interaction of the taste, everything else. So if we have our the opinion that this universe was created, then God has to be the possessor of all the knowledge and has something else also according to the way Zaratustra interprets that, and that's a knowledge of self, a self-consciousness. This is what uh, the uh, Ahura Mazda has. Now, let's pay some attention to uh, Ahura Mazda here. Ahura means the creator. Maz means uh, big, huge, all-encompassing. 
and da is knowledge. Still in Farsi, we say danish. So those Farsi-speaking people understand that this common word in Farsi. So is the creator who is the possessor of all knowledge. Nothing else is assigned to Ahura Mazda, except for being the possessor of all knowledge. Then I spoke already about the imaginary God. And God by Zaratustra is not described as human beings' saviors. Savior. God is not our savior. Zaratustra says it's our own responsibility to do the right things and to have a pleasant life. And as our good movement was saying, have radiant happiness. Happiness in the religion of Zaratustra has a top priority. But it's not just regular happiness. For me to make myself happy and listen to music and dance and say I'm following the religion of Zaratustra. No, my happiness has to be radiant. Make the environment, the, the creation around me happy. Now that includes everything. And this is the root of the uh, uh, Zaratustra's uh, respect for all elements. The Zaratustra, by some, some modern people, is called the first ecologist or environmentalist of the world 4,000 years ago. The, the Zaratustra prohibits the uh, contamination of running water or any water fire, wind, the air, and what else? And the soil. So the four elements, in Farsi they are called chahar akhshij. Chahar means four, akhshij means elements. Now I already uh, addressed, yeah, God is not the dispenser of benefit. If we do good, is not God that is looking down from up there and reward us either in this world or the other world. Does not dispense benefits. No matter how much you, you pray, how much you cry, how much you do the right thing, is not God who is paying attention and giving you benefits. So where do benefits come from? From Asha, the universal rule which was set by, by uh, Ahura Mazda. Ahura Mazda created certain rules in this world. If you do certain things, you make yourself unhappy and the entire creation, not only human beings, the entire creation around you unhappy and suffering. So it's not God who is paying attention. He did his job. He cannot change the Asha, Asha Arta order. The, the uh, word order comes from Arta or Asha. Asha changed to Arta and then order. So uh, it comes from there. God cannot change his own rules and create miracles and magical type of things, as I mentioned. I mean, the consequences of our action has nothing to do with God's pleasure or displeasure. But we assume since he set the rules, if God exists, should be unhappy when if we do wrong things and make the entire creation suffer. Now, the interesting thing here is that Zaratushtis are responsible for their own action. By this type of philosophy, Zaratustra has changed the locus of control. Meaning that in some other religions, the locus of control is up there. I have to do certain things to make God happy. I have no control. But in Zaratustra religion, from 4,000 years ago, he said, you are responsible. 
for what happens to you. You are in control of now and the future until you are alive. Now, there are certain verses from Gathas. Uh, I wanted to pay some attention to the teaching of Zaratustra now. Uh, I already explained most of them. If you can read them, please read them. Uh, is a little bit, yeah, yeah, you can read them. So if you just scroll down so uh, people who are interested can read some uh, verses uh, from the Gathas. By the way, the teachings of Zaratustra, as our good Mubad indicated, they are called Gathas. Gathas means the songs, the songs. They are all in poetic form. They are not prose. They are in poetic forms. And uh, it's extremely small collection. If it's printed in regular book print, perhaps it's about 45 pages. That's all. Zartushra only addresses things that he knew existed in his own mind. He does not address things that he didn't know. He was not too verbose. He was very brief in his pronouncements and in his gathas. Uh, there are, there are uh, prophets who God have spoken a lot. I mean, they say things, and it seems like if you read from the beginning to, to the end, it seems to any neutral observer, like the prophet forgot what he had said in section one. By the time he gets to section 20, he had forgotten what he said and completely contradict what's been said in earlier chapters of their book, so to speak. So uh, Zaratustra did not commit that mistake. All he spoke was 6,000 words in Gathas. It's in poetic form. And this is how, after 4,000 years, uh, we recite exact words as Zaratustra spoke, because when you say things in poetic forms, it cannot be changed. You change one word, it just doesn't fit. You say it with wrong pronunciation, wrong accent even, it doesn't fit. So uh, that was the genius of Zaratustra. Basically, uh, Zaratustra speaks about the freedom of choice. This is a huge thing, one of the most celebrated uh, uh, verses in, uh, in, uh, in Gathas has to do with the freedom of choice. And the other thing Zaratustra considers human beings not as God's slaves. Or Zaratustra, uh, that might not be the right word, Zartusha considers human beings as God's colleagues. God, you know, when you think about it, this is the way of my thinking. I haven't seen it uh, anywhere else. Don't blame anybody else for what I'm saying. If God did not need us, why he would go through trouble creating us, even if you believe in a God of that type? Why? I mean, just to watch us and laugh? No, it seems like our task is to finish and improve upon God's creation. So according to Zaratustra's teaching, we are God's colleagues. We are God's friends. Zaratustra himself, when he addresses uh, Ahura Mazda, speaks to him like he's speaking to a friend. It's very interesting if you ever get the chance to actually look at the now, his message is a reflective message. It's not a prescriptive message. Religion of Zaratustra is not the religion of do and don'ts. It tells you certain things. When you read Gatha several times, you, you feel certain change in your own mentality. And Upon reflection on those issues that you have read and observed, then 
you have a tendency to become an Ashaban. Ashaban means followers of Asha. What's Asha? I told you already. The main laws of universe. So you become an Ashaban. And that is, it doesn't tell you do this, do that, uh, how to divide your inter inheritance, what part of a pig you can eat, one part you cannot eat, what you can drink, what you cannot, none of these things. It says use your own judgment, your own best judgment, use the best knowledge available to you, and according to that act, eat or drink what you think is right for you. Some times ago, uh, some of you might have heard about it, there was, it was more than a year ago, there was a, uh, uh, conference in Claremont University School of Theology, School of Religion actually, uh, was there and the title of the conference was, was Food and Faith. Food and Faith. And everybody in that conference stood up with some degree of pride and they said, you know, religion, you know, these are the things that we cannot eat. This is the things that we can eat. And of course, they also spoke of their uh, food cuisines and traditions, things like that, which was very pleasant. It got to be my turn. I had nothing to say. Uh, you know, and uh, they said, what kind of food do you eat? I said, Sp I speak to my nutritionist. <laughs> then, uh, <laughs> my physician, <laughs> you know, who else? So, uh, you know, what do you drink? Well, whatever works for me, you know. I don't drink much except for water because I'm diabetic. And I know if I drink what can happen to me, so I don't. Uh, you know, it's that type of thing. Anyways. Now, Muba already uh, addressed uh, our main motto of the religion. We have two main mottos, which actually are the opening of the gathas. One speaks of how to regulate your personal life. The other one is about how to regulate your community life. Every child, by age six, seven almost, in uh, our religious tradition should know these two, uh, uh, these two verses, these two prayers. And, uh, so the Asham Wahu that uh, our good Mubad recited here uh, says righteousness is the best good. We have many goods. Righteousness is the best good. It is radiant happiness. Radiant happiness comes to the person to whom righteousness is for the sake of the best righteousness alone. You do the right things because it's the right thing. You don't do the right things for consequences in this world or next world, or next life if such a thing exists. So we are obligated to do the right things because they are the right thing to do, which is an obvious thing. But no, in many other religions, you have to do the right thing in order to prevent bad things from happening to you because God is watching. Now, how to regulate the community life. This is Ahuna Vairyo. Ahuna Vairyo, uh, okay, the, let me be brief here and just read it. Both the Lord and the leader. We have the Lord. The Lord is basically the, your religious, uh, uh, your religious, uh, uh, yeah, the person whom you follow in terms of your beliefs. It's called the Lord. And the leader. Leader is the one who are chosen uh, for the community, to lead the community. So it says both the Lord and the leader are to be chosen for their righteousness. These two appointments are made with good mind so that the acts of life are done for the wise one, meaning Ahura Mazda. 
and the dominion of God is well established in which the chosen person becomes the rehabilitator of the rightful who are oppressed. So it says in the community, the leaders of the community actually have to think and act to free the oppressed and the uh, it's interesting in, in Gata's language it says Daragobil. Now in Persian, Daragobil has today still is used as Daryuze, the ones who don't have much. And they have to go from door to door in order to get their food. So basically says in your community, you have to be the supporter of the poor who are good. Now, if they are bad, put them in jail, I think. <laughs> Anyways, I'm really, there are plenty of other slides and plenty of other things that I can talk about, uh, but I think I, uh, you are by now should be tired enough, so I stop talking, and uh, if there are any questions you have, uh, I'll be very happy to answer, but I know uh, I should not stand between any man or woman uh, uh, between the, any man or woman and his or her food. So uh, that's what's waiting for us, but if you have any questions, I'll be very happy to answer. Thank you. Espam, Espam Jafar. Hi, Jafar. <laughs> yes, I know. <laughs> I could guess. One, one question I have is uh, how are the current uh, followers in the Islamic Republic treated uh, uh, as far as educational, lack of educational opportunities and uh, home mortgage, uh, denial of home mortgages and things of that sort with the uh, current Islamic Republic? And, and how was that before the Islamic Republic? Well. Uh, let me answer this by saying not as badly as we have been treated in the past. So <laughs> from that point of view, I want to start with a, uh, a positive thing. By past, I mean until the time of the Pahlavi dynasty. Now I give you a little bit of explanation why I say that. Now, uh, through the centuries, up until four centuries ago, our population in Iran was more than two million and a half. The entire population of the country was about 11 million four centuries ago. Two million and a half still were practicing Zoroastrianism. But over the centuries, uh, you know, I don't want to say how, but their number diminished. Now, I can tell you only one example that has been registered in various historical books uh, in Arabic and in Farsi, that uh, during the time of a person by the name of Yazid ibn Muhallab, Yazid ibn Muhallab was a uh, governor appointed uh, by the Abbasid uh, people to Iran to rule the uh, uh, the Gorgon Tabaristan, yes. And he uh, had a hard time to conquer uh, that land. And he promised himself and uh, peoples around him that if I ever defeat these people, I uh, run a water mill by their blood. Now, are you familiar what water mills are? Yeah, so uh, once he conquered uh, that land, that state, well, you can guess what happened. Killed and killed for three days and nights. And the mill would not run. So they decided to add water to the blood. 
Now, I'm not, you know, uh, hesitating to talk because they were Zartushtis, they could be any human being. Any human being, any part of the world. That should not happen to men, women, and children. This is only one story. There were a lot of other subtle types of uh, prejudicial treatment of Zartushtis over the centuries. Now, I told you four centuries ago, uh, there were two and ha more than two and a half million Zartushtis. By the advent of Pahlavi's regime, which was 60 years ago, their numbers had reduced to 7,000 in the entire land of Iran. The Zartushtis were under 7,000. We were on the verge of total extinction. And with the advent of Pahlavi's regime, the religion started to prosper as a result of the freedom. And we had a tremendous number of college professors, professionals, physicians. At one time, the highest ranking military, Artish Bodaryana, was Zartushti. And you know what has happened after that. Now, in order to enter uni a university, you have to have a letter of recommendation from your local mosque. Now, go get that if you are Zartoshti. Good luck. But some do. You know, they go in there and they pretend you have to say only one sentence, Ashhadu Allah, this and that. You know, you say it and uh, uh, right in front of the mullah, they give you good recommendation. And uh, then, of course, they keep an eye on you if you are doing what you are supposed to do. In Tariq Bukhara, which is a history book, famous history book, says that in Bukhara, which was part of the Iranian Empire, and there were Bukhara and Samarkand. Bukhara and uh, Samarkand is what in English? I don't remember. Uh, what's that? Yes, yes. So uh, at that time, they assigned an Arab to every, an Arab person to every family to live with them, to make sure that these people have converted sufficiently. They are not just pretending that they have converted. So amazing things have gone on. And so when I said uh, I wanted to start in a positive note, uh, worst thing has happened to us. And uh, fortunately, none of those type of things uh, have, has happened so far. Uh, our numbers are not sufficient in Iran even to run a toy, um, uh, toy water mill. <laughs> so uh, they are leaving us alone. And most Zartoshis are leaving the country. And anyways, any other questions? Or did I answer your question, do you think? Uh, one more. Yes, yes, go ahead, please. I have one, one more question, sir. Yes. Um, about King Darius and King Cyrus and the equality between men and women did that come directly from this religion? Uh, very good question. I'm glad you asked that. By the way, I recommend this book, if you are interested, Cyrus the Great by Larry Hedricks. Now, Larry Hedrick actually published this abridged book. The main book, somewhere here, I should say, by Xenophon. Yeah, on top, see, Xenophon. Xenophon was a Greek historian. Now, Greeks and Persians are historical enemies, but Xenophon, I said Xenophon, Xenophon is, uh, wrote a book about 800 pages on Cyrus's life. Cyrus is Kurosh in Farsi, 
Now, Greeks had a problem pronouncing, pronouncing sh, so Zaratustra became Zoroaster in Greek and then Latin and English. And Kurosh became Cyrus. Anyway, now Xenophon was, uh, Xenophon was uh, our enemy, basically, can be considered. But in this particular case, he could not help it. He wrote an excellent book about Cyrus's character. And uh, it's very difficult reading to read and understand Xenophon's book, which is about eight, nine hundred pages. I gave up after about 150 pages of it. But I'm glad that this abridged edition was worked out by uh, Larry Hedrick. And this is a very good book and addresses uh, a lot of administrative issues and it has become almost a required reading for good administrators. So now, addressing the equality of men and women, there is, uh, in Gathas, as I told you, about the youngest daughter and the name that he chose, and Zaratustra dedicated almost more than half of a full chapter of Gathas to the wedding of his youngest daughter. He only named, mentioned the names of his son, and he gave his daughter the most glorified name, as I told you, Porachista and also dedicated half a section of the last section of Gothas uh, to his youngest daughter. And everything, I don't know if you were able to read or not, every time that he uh, comes up you know, with one of those celebrated verses, he says, for example, every man and every woman is not saying that you have to do this. Every man and every woman, you have to listen to the best words and choose according to an enlightened uh, thought. I, I'm paraphrasing, I can't remember the exact wording, but anyways, this is what he does. There is no difference. If there is a difference, is a preference of women to men, which I don't understand. Now, which one is which? I'm confused. Well, uh, I'm confused too about it. I, I think uh, I was not born divine, so <laughs> that so, I know. But, uh, in, yeah, in, you know, I think you are referring to the Christianity that uh, God has sent the Savior to save us from the... Uh, what call it original sin, or am I using the right term? Yeah, original sin. I think this is what you are referring to. Uh, you know, I mean, that's one way of thinking about things, and uh, there are many, many millions of people who uh, think that way, and they like it, and as long as, you know, they don't get into my face and uh, calling me a sinful this, sinful that, you know, I totally respect and accept their opinion uh, if this is what they want to believe. So, as I said, you know, we don't have to correct other people. All we have to do is to teach about our own religion. And uh, as I was speaking uh, to uh, Professor Miramadi, I hope a day will come that uh, each one of us will have a different religion. That would be total freedom if that ever happens. So, uh, you know, I'm not against any particular ideology as long as they don't put it into action. Now, during the, uh, you all know, during the Pope Innocente III, have you heard of that Pope? Innocente is innocent in, in Italian language. <laughs> Paul Innocente III was far from being Innocente. He was not an innocent man. He killed so many people. He uh, would put 
elder women, basically, through certain tests. And there were a lot of neurologists and uh, physicians who would cooperate with him in order to recognize who was a witch and who was not. One of the tests that was developed the, by the Pope in Chente was if you suspect a witch is a witch, you know, a person is a witch, just tie him up <laughs> and throw him in the pool. If, if she sinks, she's innocent. If she stays on top of the water, He's got some satanic forces working for him, kill him, kill him. So there was no way to win from the Pope. So uh, unless they do these type of things, you know, to uh, eradicate the sinful from the source of the sins, they thought the witches uh, were the source of the sin in this world and they were the cause that all those bad things like tsunamis, earthquake, things like that happen. Still, some of the mullahs in Iran actually believe the same. Remember that uh, mullah said uh, the reason that in Haiti there was an earthquake was because of their number of uh, their number of uh, single motherhood, their number of single mothers. Basically, they were the ones. Now, if they start killing this people, then we all have to say something. But as long as they don't, it's the only idea, even though it seems wrong to us. So what? We all have some wrong ideas. Is uh, when a child is born, yes. he, has a, he or she has a divine soul. Well, they say as but long as... a child they... cannot be sinful to be born. That's what... Well, I, you know, I understand certain people go to that extent, but most they don't. You know, even during Pope Innocente, they didn't kill any children. They basically killed old ladies. So, uh, you know, I mean, I'm sure the old ladies have <laughs> committed some sins. We all commit some sins. So as long as they leave me alone, you know, I'm fine with it. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, sorry, thank you. Uh, you mentioned that Zartush or uh, the religion it didn't mention anything about afterlife or next world. Yes. yes. So I'm thinking that um, we know that this world is not capable of rewarding us. No matter how religious you are, how you are following your religion and faith, you can get suffer from this world. So where we can get reward from being a good person? You know what I mean? It's yeah. one question. And another question mm -hmm. is that you said God is not responsible for rewarding us. Mm -hmm. So then who is here to judge if you're doing according the right way, according to religious or not? Because mm -hmm. if it's upon us, for example, in the same religion, you can interpret the religion according to your interests, and I can interpret it according to my interests. You know what I mean? So yeah. there should be one person who judges somewhere else that if we did a good job or not. Yeah. And See, as I said, you know, these are Zartushra's opinion, which uh, I accept, but I'm not saying they, they are the only right ideas or everybody has to accept those. Now, uh, see, the God has set the rules. If you sow uh, barley, you are not going to get wheat. You get barley. This is a rule, say, that has been set by God. And if you follow this rule, you will get the consequences that God has set. Now, God in himself even cannot change those consequences. So you decide for yourself who is the judge. There is no judge. You know, there are only rules. Now, if you follow those rules, which are righteous rules, now how you can know which rule is right, which one is not? What action is right? We all say right actions. What's right action? What's good? Zaratushra constantly talks about good, good, right. So one would ask, how do you know which one is right, what's wrong? Zaratushra, in his genius, says that whatever causes progress in the world, not destruction, progress, is right thing to do. So 
Now, you say, well, I might make a mistake. You're right. Now, we are moving toward becoming God by increasing our knowledge. According to Zarathustra's theology, human beings are capable of becoming God-like or God. If we ever possess the entire knowledge which is encoded this entire universe, we become God. We can create another universe. Now, is that likely that we get there? Not in my lifetime. Not anytime soon. <laughs> Not in a million years. Not in 10 million years. But eventually, if we acquire the entire knowledge, we can do God-like things. We already are doing God-like things. This is why some of the clergy of certain religions, they are against science. They say, you are taking away my people by teaching them science, by saying these things. You are heretic. I mean, if there were certain people here, they would definitely feel like I'm heretic myself because I'm saying that God is helpless. He cannot change the rules of this universe. No, he cannot. How you can deviate from a rule that you've signed off on? God has signed off on certain rules and regulations and laws. And he's not going to deviate. He makes fun of himself if he deviates from those rules. So nobody is watching us as far as I'm concerned. You ask somebody else, as I said, you might get another opinion. We have to watch ourselves. Then uh, what's your opinion, as I said, about the people who are doing according to the to their faith, okay, imagine the Zartosh, and they're doing whatever the Ahura Mas was asking them. But still, they're suffering a lot in this world. So what is yeah. the, the rewards? What are they gonna do? I mean, if there's not another life or? Yeah, you know, th th we are nothing. We are just minuscule dots on a minuscule planet. I mean, this idea that we are huge, we are big, we are the only, object or the only thing that God is paying attention to and God is in charge of my life? No. God is not in charge of my life. God has set certain rules. If I'm diabetic, I was born diabetic. Did I commit any sins before becoming diabetic? No. Do I have a very good life? Excellent life. I've been diabetic 42 years. Should I say God is responsible for that? No. It, it's the mixture of DNA from my parents, grandparents, past generations, got through to me according to the laws of universe. There was one wrong gene in there and acted to become diabetic. I would have not been standing in front of you if I had become diabetic a century ago. I would have died a long time ago, 42 years ago. So who is... The, who is God like here? We are doing the work of God, each one of us, each doctor, each surgeon, each one of us that we have a e positive influence, productive, progressive influence in another human beings. We are doing the work of God. Now, if we increase our knowledge, we become God like ourselves. And we have to do, we, we will be capable of doing only godly things once we get there. Let's hope in another billion years. Yeah, the, the in Persian tradition for thousands of years, uh, at the beginning of time, there was no matches, of course. There was nothing to light a fire. So in every home, the man or the woman, the adult of the home, would take the responsibility to keep the fire burning. And over centuries, it became a huge shame if the fire was not burning in, in a particular. Before the dawn, the head of the household had to go from door to door and eventually go to the fire temple to get a piece of fire and bring it home and uh, the, uh, light up the fire again. So fire became a sort of sacred 
in Iranian life and in the life of many other people, in churches, in mosques, even, you know, they uh, light candles. So why is that? It, because fire in our unconscious mind is a source of warmth, friendship, victory, per permanence, brightness, enlightenment, all these things. It, it, it's the killer of darkness. People used to fear nights because it was dark and they could not see the animals and this and that, you know, imagine things get scared. So fire becomes sacred. And Zarathustra, really, if uh, he was alive during any uh, time in the history, he would not burn books, he would not destroy places, according to my understanding of his character. He would not do any of those things. So he said, well, people respect fire, so uh, let's continue to respect fire. Now, in Gathas, even there is no indication of that, that Zarathustra said, you have to set fire in your uh, the temple. There is no indication. In two places in Gathas, there is a mention of fire. And in both places, it comes as atarascha manangascha. The, the fire of my thinking, manang mentality, the word mentality comes from man, mananga, atarascha manangascha, the fire of my mind. This is the only two places that are Tosh. Then there is hapten haiti, hapten septen, hapten means seven, septa. So hapten haiti, the uh, seven gathas, the seven songs, which were written after Zarathustra by his disciples. Few of his disciples wrote the Hapten Haiti, which is in the same language as Gathas. It's the only part of Avesta. Avesta means Zarathustri literature. It's the only part of Avesta which is in similar language than Gatha. In that, there is a lot of this type of thing that Zarathustra uh, says, uh, uh, respect the elements in the nature. Zarathustra uh, praises uh, all entire nature from the, says from the running water to the fl flying bird, those type of beautiful poetry. So uh, that's where the command comes to uh, respect the nature and elements of nature. Uh, not from the Gathas, from Hapten Haiti, but it's very consistent with teachings of Zarathustra. Well, thank you very much. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, this is uh, not a question, but a, a further information that I, I saw one of these uh, big, uh, you know, uh, Cinemax type of uh, screen on one of the theme parks. They were talking about the universe and, and all that. And they said that the fire was the first element. And after fire, you know, uh, there were the other elements came about, you know, that was one thing. And in, when I visited Washington DC uh, several years ago, on the railway station, the main railway station of Washington, D.C., I was surprised to see in big bold letters, it says, fire was the greatest discovery uh, that, uh, you know, civilized human beings. So fire, you know, uh, besides what uh, Yes, there is said. nothing else which changed the life of human beings like fire. I mean, that's uh, something that at the beginning really it brought people together because they needed each other for various reasons just to keep the fire up. So, uh, and also the, uh, the uh, cooking of food coincided with that, which supposedly has prolonged the human being's life. I'm not too sure of that, so there is good and bad. But uh, yes, it has a profound effect uh, on the progress of human beings. Now, do we do this for that reason? Not really. But it has become a tradition, and we have to keep up the traditions of our ancestors. 
that my ancestors, I haven't been able to send them an email or a letter or anything like that. The only way to communicate with them is to think like them for a few hours, you know, a week, and uh, to do what they did. Exactly behave like them. Then you are in touch with your ancestors. This is why the uh, Indian nations of this country put on all those uh, feather headdresses and jump up and down uh, like their ancestors. They are communi communicating with their ancestors. They are not going to appear in the uh, Westminster Mall like that and then people say, who is this? So that's, uh, that's what we do. This is why we keep the fire, why we consecrate the fire, hopefully. And that's the reason. I thank you very much for your attention. On behalf of Cal State San Bernardino and the Persian program, We'd like to thank you as well as the speaker in the temple for um, allowing us to come here and getting the information that we received. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, good morning. Uh, I just want to make it uh, clear. Mobit Wahidi prayed a shem wahu waistemasti and he gave a translation. Now, righteousness has a very deep meaning. Righteousness means right thinking, right speaking, and right doing for the right result. However, there is a difference. When Gatha and other mantras there is a con connotation. Connotation means when the f few words in the front and the few words in the back. Hitler thought that he was doing right thinking, he was ordering right speaking, and he was thought he was right doing to get the right result to kill six million Jews. So be, be careful, the meaning of right thinking and right speaking, right reason. So did the Stalin, who killed 16 million people. So did the Chinese, so did the dictators all over the world. They destroy humanity. They brought a lot of tragedies. They brought a lot of suffering. And here where Jatushtra differs from all other people. When he says, Ashem Bahu, Vaishtimasti, the righteousness is the best good, anything you do in your mind, a bully in a high school thinks he's doing the right thing to harass a child, but it brings unhappiness. What the Hitler did, what the Stalin did, what the other dictators is in the world, they thought they were doing the right things because they wanted to control the people. But that brought suffering to the human being. Tremendous suffering. Therefore, Zarathustra says, anything you do and that brings the suffering, it's not a right thing. Thank you so much.